Ron Carter, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was saying this uh, before we started rolling that, you know, this is like a dream come true for me to even be able to talk to you, let alone be able to interview you on my platform. Well, let's see what kind of fun we can have, and, and not that it's so dark outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, I was I was looking at some uh, pictures on a friend of mine's um, uh, Facebook page, Dwight Adams, and he's a great trumpet player, uh, and I, apparently the Detroit Jazz Festival. Um, uh, you all played together. I mean, I saw a picture of it was you and the, the, um, and uh, Dwight was out front playing, and he put something. You know, this is like a dream come true. He can't believe that he's playing with. He had to pinch himself. You know, this kind of a this kind of a a, a post. And uh, Dwight and I have been uh, great friends for a long time. We grew up together uh, in Michigan. Um, he grew up in Detroit. I grew up in Lansing area. And uh, so that's how I know him. And then another person we know in common is Ralph Armstrong. And um, actually, that's 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 him right there. Okay. It's, uh, it was uh, episode episode fifty. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, I uh, grew up, you know, as a little kid, I started playing with Ralph, and uh, he's been a you know mentor and and very supportive and and all of that and he has a pretty good impression of you <laughs> I'm not going there like he can <laughs> like he can sound like you like he he can he can talk the way you talk it was it's he can, uh, he can do me <laughs> yeah he can do he can do you um and i know that you were his teacher um what was he like as a student uh I guess the general word would be precocious with no discipline. And my job was kind of show him how to be disciplined and make that precociousness lead him to a different direction. Yeah, yeah. What kind of music was there. playing in your household uh, when you were when you were growing up? When you first were aware of music, what kind of music? Primarily classical music. Uh, my 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 grade school, elementary school teacher. I got when you're 11, great, 11 years old, you're in elementary school. And, and uh, she came in one day and put us, took us to this room where she had these instruments spread on the table. She said, I'm going to start an orchestra in this, in this grade school, and here are some instruments that we're going to, I'm going to have you play for the orchestra. Just walk up and pick one that you think you like, and we'll, we'll make it work. That's basically what she was saying to us. And this is a, a elderly white person and all these black kids, man. You know, she's way ahead of her time, and we didn't know she was either. So I, I, the cello seemed to be what I was interested in, given the choices that were there. And uh, she got me a teacher, and my parents were able to afford the lessons I needed. And as I got better, I, I would, my teachers were were sensitive enough to my talent level as it was starting to show, and they would recommend me to. A, Another teacher who was able to help someone who was better, who, who could teach me more of what I, what I needed than they could teach. I went to a, through two or three teachers as I got better. And uh, ultimately, I started really, to get really pretty, pretty good. And ultimately, I went to Cass Tech. That's uh, a big high school in Detroit at the time. And uh, I was really playing really well. I mean, really playing good, you know. And I noticed that the... Uh, uh, schools at that time had these little conferences and little meetings where they wanted the music in the background. And they invariably come to Cass Tech because they had a, a great, great music department. Had a great marching band, had a great concert band, had a great orchestra, had a great chorus. I mean, it's all really great high school. And I noticed that I wasn't getting the kind of calls I thought I should get because I was as good as all the, non, all the non-black people were. And I noticed that the, the orchestra, the, the bass player, was going to graduate in January of 1955. And then my, by, by my subtraction, I realized that if he's the only one there now, if in January he's no longer there, someone has to take his place. If I'm that guy, then they have to call me. It's kind of simple. 
So I traded in my, I told my parents I wanted to trade in my base, my cello to get a base. I did. Had a paper route, the Detroit Free Press, and I helped pay for my base and my lessons, and I got a scholarship to the Eastman School of Music as a bass player, where I was there from 55 through 59. That's where we are right now. To give you an answer to the, a little more clarity for your first, first question. Yeah, so um, what is it about uh, music, and in particular improvised music, that sort of uh, uh, catches your attention? Like what about it is, um, inspires you? Uh, well, I, I think uh, the several things are involved with that, you know. And as a bass player, it's even a little, for me, a little more complicated. Uh, when people think of improvising, they think of the guy who solos his brains out all night, you know. And that's clearly one view of what the music represents, you know. As a bass player, I don't look at that as what I'm interested in doing. I do it because it's part of what I do. I'm more interested in being the guy in the back who was physically in the back, but he's musically in the front. Mm. I think the bass, as I said in my book, is the quarterback of every band. And I like to think that if bass players understood the power of their note, and I don't mean the violence of it, I don't mean that kind of power. They knew the presence. They knew what effect their note had on anyone who was listening to them play with them. And, and they basically understood that each note contained four or five elements for every note. They would probably focus, focus less on soloing and more on really giving the band a harmony lesson every night. That's what I enjoy doing. You know, I, I've known to go to the gig and say, hey man, if I don't solo for a year with your band, I'm fine, but I got some good notes for you. So for me, jazz is about that. It's not about the, the pink light on the solo and now we're featuring the bass player. It really isn't that a, that's part of my groups because I am, in fact, the leader. Uh, but I'm playing time all the time. And I like to think that one of the things that jazz means to me is the ability to find the notes you hear at the right time that causes everyone in your environment to pay, a note, pay attention to that note and the next ones to follow. Um, so, uh, so I was uh, uh, on your website and there's a, uh, certificate at the top, uh, that says, uh, Guinness world records. And, uh, the most recorded jazz bassist is Ron Carter with, what does it say? 2,221 individual recording credits, and that is, it was as verified on September 15th of 2015. That is, uh, <laughs> that's quite incredible. Well, I'm a little embarrassed because it's, it's, it's about 200 more than that now, you know? Doing on further research, my friend insists on making the number higher, and I just kind of shake my head and ask him what's wrong with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's that, that's uh, that's official. One of the questions I'm very careful how I answer is, "What is my favorite record?" Uh, and okay, one of the yeah, reasons okay. I answer that very gen generally and, and non-specifically is that the fact of the matter is, Sean, is that I treat every record day like a free lesson, and I've learned something for all those records I've done, even the ones that are not a part of that 2,251 list. You know, there are always chances for me to, to grow. If it wasn't the music, it was a chance to hear myself in the studio to make my physical adjustments. If it wasn't that, I could experiment with pickups or, or strings or concepts or endurance or patience. They all offer me a way to get better at what it is I think I want to get better at, what I need to get better at. So I'm, going, I'm, I'm backing into your answer, so to speak. With that kind of a preface to this next answer. My answer is that uh, each person I played with was a teacher. I may not have liked their, I may not have liked their song. I may have thought they didn't understand what the key did to the bass, theoretically. I may not have liked that they played too many courses or that they didn't know the real tune themselves. They didn't really, they didn't really know the melody. 
Thank you so much for watching my video so far. If you'd like to support, there are several ways to do so below. Also, likes are free. Please comment, share, and subscribe. Now back to the video. You know, or they didn't have, they hadn't thought the program through, or all these things we could pick up from a guy who's the band leader, in this case, who doesn't help you get better by his lack of preparation, for example. You know, he turns around and says, hey, man, who do you want to play next? Well, it's, it's your job. What do you want to play next? You know, you've been there before, and it's really tough to have an answer that doesn't sound uh, snide or, or what a dumb thing to ask me kind of question in the middle of the set, you know? So, uh, and I'm still back into your answer. Uh, all those band leaders, on and off the record, so to speak, figuratively and literally, offer me a chance to understand what it is to be a leader and what's some attributes that make a leader really a leader. What the leader, what does the leader do to make the side man follow him anywhere? What leader is going to say, wait a minute, this guy's got some good notes. What the hell is that all about? Show me what that is. Can you do that again? What kind of chord is that? What happened to the form? I've had band leaders turn around and say, hey man, am I sharp or flat? That lets me know two things that they're really paying attention to me. And part of that focus right now is that am I in tune? Literally in tune. Hmm. Uh, some guys don't ask me that. I assume that they know where they are and they won't need my help. Hey, look, that's okay. There are other things they can't ask me if they aren't embarrassed. You know, One of my favorite Miles Davis stories uh, is that we were playing Autumn Leaves one night, and the last chord is generally G minor, going back to the top C minor. One night I got tired of that chord, man. So my last note of the bar was a B natural, which makes it a G, <laughs> G down to seven going to the top C minor. <laughs> and Miles came, after the solo, he came back and pulled my coat, he said, what's that note? I said, be natural, man. Mix it a G7 and don't talk to me because I can't play at the same time. And he never asked me anything after that. <laughs> but he was listening to me. And he hears this note come out of nowhere after not hearing that note for how many times we played that song? Eight or nine times before this one particular time he noticed there's one note standing out there? That's my job. So my job is to get their attention. And I've been rightfully accused of playing some strange notes. Yes. That's my other job. This is a history lesson. This is a harmony lesson, guys. Get your pencil in, in your mind. Get your blackboard out and put these changes down because they're coming back to you again. Not, 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 not one, six, five. Now, let's hear something else. Here's one flat three, flat six. You know, here's a seventh chord with that seven and the bass resolved incorrectly. It's stuff. You know, right. and, and the gigs I enjoy most is when I get the right note. That's on me. That's my job. And when I see them responding to what someone would call a wrong note, except to this band leader of this particular group, that means I'm on the right track of finding a new way to reharmonize the melody. Or my rhythm makes a new impact on where the form of the tune is nailed in place by a figure I played. Or my volume. If I'm not trying to make the walls and the curtains dance like this behind the bass note, you know? They hear me that way, they say, oh, are you okay? I say, I'm fine. I'm just trying to lower the volume a little bit. You know? I want to be I want to I want to be the control of everything. I can. And if I have their attention, we'll have a great time. Having said that, your initial question was, what happens basically when the horn player plays too long? That happens when I haven't done my job. I haven't been able to command his attention. If he listens to my line, I listen to my bass line, because I think the bass line is, is, is a, a, a complimentary story to his story. If he hears my story, he'll, he will know when I think we've had enough. And one of the things I've always subjected to, Sean, is when I'm playing a solo and the horn player comes in, when he thinks I've had enough. <laughs> I'm sure that's happened to you. And you didn't have a smile. <laughs> you want to take him outside and wring his neck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've been on the call. I said, "Wait, wait, wait a minute! No, I, why did you? Why did you do that? You know? Well, I thought the tune was too long, and I thought, yeah, wait, okay, let's let's do this, band leader. The next set, 
when you play when we play the next tune, whatever it is, if I think you played enough, I'll just stop. Then you look around and say, Hey man, why you stop? Well, some words are not so nice. And I say, Well, gee, I thought you had enough. I had enough. <laughs> and it's how that feels. <laughs> it's that kind of kind of response, the kind of respect I'm commanding, I'm demanding from those horn players. And sometimes sometimes I don't get it. Sometimes maybe I'm not supposed to get it from those guys and gals. Okay, I do my best to earn it. And if they don't hear, they don't feel it, then if they don't call me back, I think they're missing a chance to get better. So I'm I'm a horn player, you know, I played saxophone first, and uh, I guess over the last 15 years I've been playing bass also. But when I started playing bass, I started to realize certain things, <laughs> uh, likely about maybe how I could have been making a bass player feel <laughs> when I started playing bass. Well, one of the things is a horn player gets to take a break. So the horn player plays the melody, maybe takes, you know, some courses, and then while other people are playing, you know, then you you can be a space cadet. You know, you're thinking about, hey, I'm kind of hungry, and you know, I could use a, you know, a hamburger right now, you know, or what that kind of thing. But the rhythm section players, in particular, the bass player, doesn't get that doesn't uh, doesn't get that chance to be a space cadet. Have to be focused in paying attention the whole time, and. Uh, one thing I feel like I, it taught me um, playing bass is uh, uh, focus um, and endurance with respect to focus. You know, uh, uh, longer longer periods of focus. You know, and actually paying better attention to the the other stuff that was going on around me. But w one thing I wanted to ask you is. Uh, I want to ask you about what is it that you practice? What kinds of things that you practice? Um, and do you have like a particular, like, do you have a, a particular routine, like a, 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 you know, you warm up for a certain period of time and then you get into uh, maybe etudes or exercises or whatever? I'm just curious about that. You know, one of the things that jazz musicians do that no one understands or appreciates is that that environment prohibits warming up to the gig. Mm -hmm. Most jazz clubs don't have a warm-up room like the orchestras do and the singers do. They have a space where you can go do these things and warm up. You know, you go to the orchestra concert and then you get there an hour early, you hear everyone in the, off, uh, the green room or somewhere down the hall, just playing away, man. So when the downbeat is ready, they've loosened up, they've got the chops together, their instruments tuned and warmed up literally and figuratively. The jazz player walks five blocks from the parking lot to the, to the, to the gig, carrying the bass in the rain or the sleet or the snow, gets into the club, puts his wet bag under the piano because there's no room for it, hangs his coat on the nearest hook on the bandstand, and goes to speed playing the first tune this fast. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're stuck with that, that, that environment. So to answer your question, I don't want to put a gig because there's nowhere to do that. Literally, there's nowhere. You know? And those places that have them, they aren't set up to really do them unless you get to a real concert hall where they have the artist room and you have a special room off to the side, off to the stage, you know? We're talking about the general nightclub situation. Right. Uh, now, when I'm at home practicing, that's a little bit different because I'm in charge of the environment. Uh, I, I, when I'm at home, I don't practice bass licks, you know? I don't practice things to do specifically for the gig. My focus, Sean, is that can I find out what the notes I hear are on the bass at any point where my hand is on the instrument. So I'm looking to develop a skill level, a technique that lets me know the bass well enough to know that if I have first finger on F sharp on the D string, what notes are there, given the chord I'm playing, would I have to move at all? You know, one of the things I do, Mr. Sean, is to, to keep the kids' attention 
is that when I say something like that, I do like this. Let's let them know that that's what I do. So when I tell them that, that I'm looking for, if I play F sharp on this finger, what notes are there, I want to know what, what notes are around that note, I say like this. I mean, I'm really good at that. That understanding as I play the bass allows me to find the notes I hear as far out as they may be for you. They're part of my logic. My job is to set this note up so that it still fits my logic, and if you listen to it again, you see how you missed it, not that I missed it. You know, uh, so my 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 approach to that is playing etudes and information to show me where these notes are located that they think I want to play. The exercises, the etudes, and the Bach pieces. I want to know where they think I'm supposed to play these notes by the notes by their choice of notes. And I refinger them as I think my skill is necessary to do to make them more playable for me. In my orchestral days, and I miss those days, believe me, the bass players all had the same fingering. So if you watch the orchestra, if you, watch, if you had the experience and you look, go to the, a concert, the bass players all had the same fingering for the same passages, right? And by and large, and I'm, I'm, proving the, I'm making a point right now, those fingers haven't changed in the past 65 years, depending on the orchest orchestra and the bass player's insistence on that kind of stuff. Agreed? My, my view was always difficult to accept because I found other ways to play those passages. But they were playing with my choice of notes. On the bandstand with a jazz gig, I pick my notes, I pick where I want to play them. At the orchestra, you kind of limit it to what they consider is a much better, a much more uniform, but unified way of the orchestra looking like we're all going to the same notes. Okay, I did that, and I'll do it again because that's part of that process. That doesn't mean I agree with that fingering, and most of the times I didn't agree. But on a jazz gig, when I'm, I'm picking the notes, even as the, even as the guy's written the bass part, I pick where I want to play them. And to make that work for me, I got to know where they're located comfortably for me in the bass. So I play what I call horizontally, this way. Not so much vertically, you know? And by doing it, it allows me to find a D flat or F sharp when I might normally have find them because I'm already where first finger is and these notes, first finger, E, e natural, F sharp, D flat, B natural, A flat, they're all there on, the, on my fingertips. I need to know that. And the best way for me to know this is by playing skill level that forces me to think in those ways. I'm good at that. Uh, to answer your question about guys playing <laughs> strange notes, uh, yeah, they're strange because they don't expect them. And I can appreciate that. So my, my job, uh, Sean, is, is to... Um, Play the first two or three courses just as they expect to hear them. Enough roots that they know I know the tune and the form of the tune, you know? And I collect to the top of the third, fourth chorus. If I play a B natural for the downbeat on the F chord and they, they blink, I know I got this guy. I got his attention because he heard that note, he wasn't supposed to hear it. Well, it's coming again, brother. Here it comes again. Bam! Only it's over here now. <laughs> and I've had guys come a year later and say, man, I didn't understand that note last year. I say, well, if you'd asked me, I would have told you. <laughs> that. And you know, I may have made some enemies. Music does that. People get embarrassed. That's, that's their embarrassment. It's not mine. I'm doing my job. My job is to inspire you. My job is not to allow that play your soul you played last night. And I'm really good at that. <laughs> So, um, I interviewed uh, uh, Rufus Reed, mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking about we were talking about in uh, so, for instance, like in in box writing, where there sort of emerges this sort of equality of voices, you know, where maybe prior to then the bass just served a certain foundational component and wasn't really uh, worked into melodic function but 
especially in the like well-tempered clavier, you start to see that all of the voices start to become treated uh, uh, with the same, you know, each note is, each, each voice is just as important. And of course, Rufus is uh, often uh, uh, credit, credited for certain approaches to playing bass lines and working in more melodic kind of ideas and things into his bass lines. Um, in your construction of your bass lines, um, I understand your uh, what you're saying your job is, is to inspire and is to find notes that are uh, within a certain positioning to be able to access those notes anytime you want to. Um, how how do you how, how are you constructing your lines? Do you have are you in in and who has been influential in your baseline construction? Like who have been some of your influences? Uh, this is a, it's a hard question for me to answer because it makes me sound selfish. You know, and I think I'm not a selfish player, but I can't mm -hmm. think of anyone who has influenced my bass lines but me. I'm not sure any bass player, any bass player does the kind of lines I try to make, you know? Mm. And we all have our, our tricks, you know, da da, da 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 We all do that, man. I'm not sure, I'm not sure that counts as being an influential person on my style, you know? Right. Or we all go da 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 We all do that, man. It's just the part, of our, part of our basic lines, part of our alphabet. But I'm not sure if I do that because someone did it eight years before or coming up. That, that necessarily influences my uh, baseline concept. If I had known you were going to ask that kind of question, I would have sent you something like this. Now, this is this I got rhythm changes, and then oh, okay. these dots show you all the notes that you could play per beat right and i have my students connect these dots to make a bass line only using chord tones and only quarter notes and only in this case half and first position i see and we do this until they get it right until i decide they're getting it right i'm not trying to concern i'm not trying to give them i'm trying to make them i'm not trying to make them make a choice of notes i'm trying to show them how many choices that they have Right. So, in other words, if you take the B flat, F, B flat, D, B flat, D, you have six notes, six notes per beat in that measure. When guys say B flat, D, F, Sean, they, uh, that's all they see, B flat, D, F. Like you. And I'm, I'm, I mean, you're the student right now. Hmm. When I see that, I see B flat, D, F, B flat, D, all of, for the first beat. So I have six note choices per beat. Yeah. Six, seven, four is how much? 24? Yes. That, that's my, no, my number of note choices in the first measure, just with quarter notes, and only chord tones. Right. So the choices we have, man, are infinite. Yeah. But you need a format, or you need a plan, you need a, you need a system to help you see what the choices are. I mean, I, I think that you can only be uh, inspirational so far. Then you need to have a plan. I mean, if, 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 if this same alto player is going to play 95 choruses or hits the fourth alto solo for the night, I'm not sure you can keep going, do, 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 do. I'm not sure you're going to be able to do that. Get away with it, man. You know? I like those guys that do that on, on saxophone. I got something for them, man. I'm going to be the last guy standing, Jack. And, and having a format helps that happen. Uh, mm. Again, I, I, had I known you would ask this kind of question, I would have recommended you, if you could pull, if you had a chance to pull up uh, my view of the Bach Brandenburg number three, mm. where I'm playing that piece, the string with a with a seventy eighteen piece string orchestra. Now I've kind of uh, my line is the solo line under the orchestra. You should you should hear that. So you can see how I use the Bach bass line, Bach bass line concept 
to make the sound piece mine. Hmm. Bach Vandenberg number three on the YouTube. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, uh, so, so how has this pandemic affected? Uh, I mean, obviously, it's I mean, it's affected everyone, all all musicians. I mean, there's less gigs, there's less stuff stuff going on. But what have been some things that? Uh, maybe some positive things that have come out of this um, and maybe just how has this whole pandemic changed things for the way that you're going about, you know, uh, teaching, playing gigs, all of that. Well, there you go. Nine questions. Let me pick, let me start somewhere amongst the nine. Uh, one of the things uh, uh, affected me probably most immediately was not the, 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 the fact that I didn't have to make decisions night in and night out about music. Being a band leader especially, when I go to the gig, I got to set from the quartet to the trio, the big band, I have a program for the week for these groups I'm playing with. And so for one week, we'll say, uh, of the trio, I'm, I'm worried about, is this the right tempo for this tune? Can I steer Russell or Donald a different direction? Can I, be, can I do better? Can I do better this night than last night? With the quartet with Jimmy and Irene and Peyton, is this the right tune for these guys tonight? Is it the right order of the program? With the big band, am I playing loud enough? Am I playing too slick for the band this time of night? Right now, I don't make those decisions because they're not to be made by me, and I'm missing, I'm missing, <laughs> I'm missing being in that kind of charge, mm -hmm. whose decision I know I make it affects everything for that night. Right now, I don't have that. I don't have that worry. I'm not, I'm not worried about the best note. I'm not worried about playing in tune. I'm not worried about being on time for the gig. You know, those worries are gone, and I miss that. You know, it forces me to take a different level on what responsibility is with gigs. Understanding what responsibility is. When you do it all the time, you just kind of do it. You know, it's kind of like all of a sudden, if you just stop and realize what it took to tie your shoe. How complicated that really is when you take me to learn how to do it. We do it so much that it's just like it's nothing to us. It's like making those decisions. It's nothing a band leader, or as a, in this case, a side man has to make. Right now, those decisions are not a part of my process anymore. And I miss the concern. I miss the pressure. I miss the need. I miss the results of making those decisions night in and night out because they're expecting that. And because I'm good at it. Now that my students have a different kind of time frame because they're not, they're not at school so much, they send me these YouTube tracks that I haven't heard in years. And I'm, I always, I've been getting embarrassed twice a week to say, oh, am I really on that record? What year was that? You know? Uh, 1987, uh, Herbie and, Herbie and, Herbie and uh, Tony and... Uh, I'd be like, just really, 1987, Japan, oh, really? See me that, that. And when I see it, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed that I don't because it really sounds great. <laughs> and the guys look nice. You know, like four guys playing some grown-up music. And, and I missed, I missed, I forgot about that event. And there are several others I have forgotten. So this time off from being so concerned about what I got to play for tonight's gig has been replaced by Gee, this gig is 18 years old, and I, I was into some nice things back in. Did I develop that to today? What happened with that? That kind of questioning my growth. Uh, it's given me a chance to, to uh, uh, not not be so concerned uh, about about approval of what I play, because I'm at home. You know. I'm, I'm, I'm really the guy who's going to prove what I do right now because I'm the only guy who's listening and playing. You know, so that, that element is gone. Uh, I miss sharing, I miss bouncing my ideas off other people. Not just musical ideas, but social ideas. You know, uh, things that concern all of us. I miss those kind of conversational opportunities. 
Orchestras, the trio, or the quartet, or the 16, those guys, they have thoughts too, man. I don't, know, I don't know how they feel about that. Did they hear about this? What did you think about that, man? You, 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 you know? How come you didn't hear about that? What's your thing? That. Because that affects how we're going to play that night. It's going to affect how I call the tunes. You know? And I'm missing that, that, um, I'm not sure what to call it, that inter conversational interplay that I don't have right now. We, we, we Zoom, I try to Zoom once a month because I want to see those guys and talk with them and see how they're doing. The, the general man-to-man, man to -man, man band leader side, man, friend to friend conversation because I want to know how they're doing as they want to know how I'm doing, you know? So we miss, we miss that, that conversational exchange, you know? Uh, and it's just, it has taught me how important that is, and how readily we do it without understanding that we really do it. Uh, I, I miss uh, uh, seeing someone respond to what we play. Mr. someone said, oh man, how did he do that? I, I miss that kind of response, whether it's a band member or someone in the audience. In my house, I'm saying, oh yeah, right. <laughs> I roll my eyes and say, oh, not again. <laughs> that. You know, okay. I can, I, can, I can do that for another, what, what, did this intermission be going on until August? <laughs> that, you know? Yeah, you know, the playing for an audience. You know, the, the so the reason I started this interview series and uh, so you're, you are episode 114. Oh, wow. I started these in March mm. and Almost the year uh, 2020 <laughs> right when the basically when the bottom fell out mm. and we knew that nothing was going to be the same right um, I was like well I, I'm really going to I'm going to miss my my friends I'm going to miss you know and, and it's not just the notes that are played. It's not just what happens on the bandstand, the music. It's like the the turning around and the little jokes and stuff that get told, all of the inside, you know. Inside humor. Yeah, yeah, all of, all of that stuff. And, you know, the stuff that, uh, you know, making those decisions about what the set list is going to be, like like you were discussing, and... You know, and having to make those like kind of last minute tweaks and changes to stuff. You know, I miss all that stuff, you know. And so I was like, man, what's a way that I can still have some of these conversations with people that I admire, respect and, you know, play music with. And and it's kind of turned into its own thing, you know, uh, and I'm just kind of going where it's it's leading. Uh, but it's been a at least a way to try to stay connected with folks but playing but playing for an audience and getting that response from the audience that's like that's like the the drug <laughs> I can't, you know and playing you know doing a pre-recorded concert i'm not complaining I'm, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to still play sometimes even though there is an, an audience but playing a pre-recorded concert, um, it's just not the, it's just, you know, it's just not the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, there was some thought uh, before this intermission, I'll call it, lasted this long, that streaming would be a way to help the industry survive, and that when we got back to more, like the good old days, that streaming will still be a part of it. And I think that's a, a mistake that's not going to, I think it's not going to happen. I, I think mm -hmm. the jazz community is not geared to sitting at home and hearing streamed concerts all night or whenever they can. You know, I think that they are also part of the music scene. You know, and while, while it's nice to stay at home and not worry about parking your car or getting dressed up to go to the Blue Note to hear an act, uh, there's something to say about getting dressed up, going to the Blue Note to hear that act. <laughs> that's, that's right. right. That's right. Well, they're part of it. You know, it's, it's their, 
they're wanting to go to mix with the crowd and see new people and be a part of the group excitement when something really happens nice, you know? And, and, and uh, I think we can't replace that, no matter how good we play streaming, because they want to be a part of the activity of a live performance, their presence, you know? So we'll, we'll, we're waiting to, to hope that the clubs can stay solvent, can stay around, can stay available, uh, uh, given what they've been asked to survive and not been able to have a, a full house to make some money to come come the fall whenever this animation gets over. Hopefully there's going to be a place for the audience, to, there, will, there will be places for the audience to be an audience, and a bandstand that would be full of musicians to respond to this audience when it's time to allow that to happen. You know? it's, difficult. it's a strange, strange time right now, no question. Yeah, very, very strange. You know, one thing about um, actually, you know, playing in a real space with an audience is, you know, it's the acoustics of the of the building that 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 might be one of those things that I miss the most is just the way that different rooms sound, you know, and then although maybe I wasn't as aware of this before or I took it for granted now it's like that's what i <laughs> that's like one of the things that <laughs> that i miss the most mm-hmm. um and uh yeah that's tough oh by the way victor wooten told me to say hello oh thank you mr b dub yeah what a yeah. wonderful player man really yeah and a lovely man yeah yeah he's 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 a bad dude that's okay. also also a beautiful beautiful human being absolutely v dub yeah <laughs> all right um so we were talking about the uh the the pandemic and and things are you doing any like online lessons teaching I'm, students I'm teaching at manhattan school of music i have five students with them starting again this month i guess this is february when school starts mm-hmm. and uh, i have five non-manhattan school students yeah i've been teaching for a long time and, and uh, i'm learning how to do it better online you know, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting certain things that I found just unacceptable, like the student's Wi-Fi no longer functioning, for example, you know, or the, the, the image freezing or, or the sound not being okay. There's nothing they can do about that, you know, or having a lesson and the dog starts barking, you know. It, it's the stuff that makes it, it breaks your concentration. Uh, and while I, I understand that, I'm trying to, I've worked myself into the place where that's the environment that they're playing and how difficult it is for them to play that, not just for me to have a lesson. So I've kind of understood really what they're going through to be productive at this lesson, knowing that the practice times are, are disrupted by the dog barking and, and they're doing the errands to go to the store and take out the garbage. Yeah, okay, so I'm understanding that. So my, my, my solution is to give them one less etude that they're responsible for. They can put that one less A to a time to being a good son or a good brother or a good dishwasher and dryer. But the lesson may not be better, but he'll be more comfortable with practicing and ultimately he will get better because he's learned how to make that practice time more valuable. You know, something I've been concerned about with uh, students with my students is uh, just mental health, you know. Uh, it's just not, uh, you know, human beings are social creatures. And, you know, there's that saying, uh, what, that thing that Miles said, you know, don't call it jazz, you know, you know, it's a social music, you know, you know, call it social music. And, and that sort of being able to get out and, make friends around the music and you know using using each concert each jam session as like a it's like a bonding thing it's like a you know people just getting out and um yeah so i'm 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 concerned about students but even prior to the pandemic it seems like the younger uh you know, younger generations, uh, it seems like they are increasingly 
sort of less kind of connected with other musicians you know um yeah you have to be connected when you play a gig together but because of youtube uh it seems like a lot of the listening and watching you know concerts and stuff is like i said it's watching concerts and not actually going to a concert or even when listening to music it doesn't seem like there's a lot of okay i just bought this record hey let's get a pizza and then all of us are going to get together and listen to it it doesn't seem like there is mu as much of that and so the the pandemic seems like it has uh, taken a lot of those those tendencies in obviously because of of social distancing and health reasons um uh, but then just also just the tendency not to be as necessarily connected with the, you know, with the, with other musicians and stuff. Um, I mean, do you get the sense that your, your students are maybe, uh, uh, listening to music or, or how do I say con consuming content or consuming music, uh, in a way that is, uh, maybe not as beneficial or something? Well, you know, I, that's a hard question because I haven't seen them in three months, you know? Well, so, well, I don't I don't necessarily mean... Uh, I think the pandemic has made everything worse, right? But I mean even before the pandemic. Um, do, do, you get, do you get the sense that younger... Uh, that you're... Especially with younger students that the way that they are consuming concerts and stuff on YouTube, that that's not necessarily having the same sort of impactful, like meaningful, you know, they're not getting as much out of the music. No, that's, I'm, that's what I'm, I mean. I'm more concerned, uh, uh, Sean, that when I give them assignment, like building bass lines, mm. the only way you can get that really right is on the gig. The lessons can only show you so much stuff. And I, and I understand that. You know, we can, we can go through this connect the dots exercise and f f until we get tired of seeing the dots <laughs> go like this, you know. Mm -hmm. What they need to do is go out and make the mistakes based on this concept and figure it out. I think this pandemic didn't allow them to, has not allowed them to do that. They have not, it, has not, it has not allowed them to put these lessons in play. Uh, some, some kids in, in, my, in the neighborhood have these garage, uh, uh, little garage concerts or driveway concerts. So some, sometimes they're, they're finding ways, not just to play with each other, but the bass players who are my students who are in these outside concerts, they're finding a way to put the stuff we talk about and I show them at the lessons in play and find out how they do or do not work in real time more than six minutes. I'm more concerned about that than anything else. Of course groups are necessary, man, and the camaraderie and making decisions and hanging, yeah, I'm okay. I'm, no, that's, what, that's what music is, is, is that's, 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 the, uh, uh, that's the workshop, the bandstand. I'm more concerned that they don't have a chance to put what we talk about in play live more than anything else. Of course, we're all concerned that we'll be, what's going to be left for them to play in when this is all over. How many clubs will be left standing? You know, they're closing right and left. They're having fundraisers, and sometimes they're successful, sometimes they aren't. Uh, there are several clubs that have closed in New York that whether they open again in, in the fall, no one can tell. I'm just talking about the New York area. Uh, during the course of the pre-pandemic, my students would go around to these small restaurants and set up a duo inside just because they wanted to play, and the owner was amenable to having another attraction for his restaurant. Will those club, will those restaurants still be open? Excuse me, still be open? Will they be allowed to have more than 25 people and no, and no live music? I mean, those are my concerns on that level. But my primary concern is where are these kids going to have a chance to try this stuff out? How can they get a chance to build a baseline if they have nowhere to build it other than in their practice room or one hour a week at a lesson? I'm a little more concerned with that. 
Now, you're a composer. Um, has this has this time uh, uh, I mean, are you are you working on any compositions now? Has this time been fruitful in that way for you? I'm working on some books for my publishing company, uh, but not tunes as sense of compositions. I'm working on some transcriptions. I'm working on some building a bass line. I'm working on some. Uh, uh, I'm working on selling my bio, my my bio. If you go to my website, roncarterbooks.com, you'll see my library. Uh, our books and, and etudes and, and uh, classical pieces. I've written several classical pieces already. And so this is my time right now to, since I'm not making gigs at night, to sit down and put together, uh, to understand how a publishing company really works, be a part of its growth, and put some books in that library that I think need to be published and need to be seen by people other than inside my head. So I have, book, I have, I have several books that helped that process and uh, take a look so you enjoy what you see yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to do that and I will uh, in the description of this video I'm going to I'll link that so people can can find that great <laughs> all right now well, my friend and I'm sure I'll see you in the club next time you say hello and, and ask me that I really mean that when I see you again <laughs> all right now God bless you thank you all right now <laughs>